All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your favorite class. Dang it. Today is a discussion on the midterm exam. Uh, as a reminder, I've posted sort of exam instructions to Blackboard, and I've also posted a study guide for the midterm exam uh, on Blackboard as well. Uh, what we're going to do today, I'll just kind of go over the mechanics of the exam, how it's going to work, what you guys want to do, uh, let you ask some questions. Then we'll start in on the study guide and kind of get as far as we can get on the study guide before our time runs out. So first things first, let's talk about uh, the exam instructions. OK, so this will kind of go over logistics and what you'll expect maybe before the exam, during the exam and how you're going to turn your exam in. So I'm going to share my screen with you and pull up the document, uh, which I call sort of this online exam instructions. So hopefully you can kind of all see this document at this point. All right. First things first, the exam is going to be open everything. So I can't police you and I'm not going to try. Uh, so you get whatever you want. All right. You want notes in front of you. You want the Internet. You want your phone. You want a calculator. All is fine. I'm not going to try to stop you from using anything. All right. So there you go. Uh, before the exam happens, good idea to get all your stuff in place. All right. And so you'll need pencil, paper, calculator, equation sheets, whatever, all the stuff that you want prepared for the exam, right? Then you're just going to join the lecture as normal, but instead now of having everything muted, like your camera and your microphones, you got to turn your camera on, okay? The reason why I do this is because I need to know that it's sort of you taking the test, not that I believe that there are a lot of other people that would be able to take this test, even in like the country. <laughs> um, I mean, you got to like think about that, right? Like think about there's not many people that can do the analysis that's required for this upcoming test. I mean, it makes you unique. We've been working on building stuff for like 15 weeks back to ME 429. So you got a lot of skills now that not a lot of other people have, but I still got to make sure that it's you sort of doing the, uh, doing the exam. Okay. So turn on your camera, leave the mic muted and point your camera toward you in your workspace. I did this with uh, exam number one for my ME 2003 class and they did great. So uh, if a bunch of sophomores can do it, a bunch of dummy sophomores can do it, uh, so can you guys. Rawr. All right. Uh, if you got any problems with this sort of setup or situation, just let me know. OK, the reason I need to do this, like I said, I just need to know that it's you doing the work. I don't want others to be able to see the work on your paper. So it's got to kind of strike a balance between being kind of too far away where I can't really see anything to too close where it's like right on your paper. So here's a good example shot of yours truly working on stuff. So there's actually stuff written on that paper. You can't even really see it, right? This is kind of a good halfway medium, so to say. I understand that many of your cameras are located on the bottom of your laptop screen. So you might have to kind of like do like a prop up kind of thing or I don't know, you're engineers, you know, figure it out, right? Like you're smart, okay? Just make it happen. So that's what you're gonna wanna do before the exam. Kind of get all these things prepared, get your pencils and papers prepared, have your camera pointed at your workspace so that I can kind of see what's going on. All right, the way I'm going to distribute the exam, I'm going to post it to Blackboard and I will email it to you. OK, so uh, the Blackboard will be the fastest for you because it'll basically be instantaneous. The email usually takes maybe like a minute to come through. OK, so I will release it to Blackboard. I will email it to you uh, right at eight o'clock at normally scheduled le lecture time on Friday. You'll have an electronic copy of it on your laptop. You don't need to copy the problem number down. You don't need to print it off. You don't need to really work on that exam in any way. OK. All I'm going to ask is that when you're working on it, you tell me what problem number you're working on. So you're going to do all of your problems by hand on scratch paper in front of you or whatever paper you have in front of you, line paper, white paper, whatever you want. OK, so you can do all your work in front of you. You have to make sure that you put what number you're working on obviously on the problem so I know what you're doing all right the 50 minutes to do the work and then 10 minutes to email me all right so 50 minutes to do your stuff uh, and then once you're done email the handwritten solutions that you have for that particular exam right to me just like you would email me handwritten portions of your homeworks so you've had a couple of tries of practice at sort of like taking a picture of handwritten stuff that you've done and sending it to me. So hopefully you're accustomed to this well enough where you know how to kind of get a good picture of it or get a good scan of it, so on and so forth. All right. Lastly, I'll be there. I'll be kind of watching all of you guys um, do your work. 
I'll be available for questions, so I will be present. You can ask questions in the chat or send me an email. I uh, prefer that you don't come on the mic and ask a question. So that's kind of the logistics, and that's been out since Monday. I just went over it now, so I want to open it up now if people have any questions. So I'll maybe wait 30 or so seconds and see if people have any any questions in the comments. Hopefully you kind of understand the logistics there. It doesn't seem that complicated. And I did this with about 50 students without any issues about two weeks ago. So hopefully we should all be good to go. All right. Well, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Uh, if you do have any comments or questions or anything like that, can you use our MATLAB functions to calculate things? Yes. Sure. I have to see enough information on your paper to believe that you can do it by hand. All right. So if you're going to do a transformation matrix like a T matrix, you should probably show me the T matrix, including like the M's and the N's and all that stuff. All right. I need to be able to know that you can calculate entries of an A matrix, B matrix or D matrix. All right. So if you just if I gave you a, a workout problem that was like calculate for me the D26 entry and you just wrote the answer on your paper. Well, OK, that's not that's not useful. All right. I need to see the problem solving steps that tell me that you would be able to do it by hand. And if you don't provide me enough information there to prove to me that I think that you'd be able to do it by hand, I'm not I'm going to take points off. All right. I have to see it sort of like step by step as far as you go. Do you think questions will be complicated enough to warrant the use of MATLAB functions? They will not. You can do everything by hand with your calculator. You do not need MATLAB functions. I've written the exam already. I know what it's like. You don't need to use MATLAB for the test. I promise. It would help you check answers, possibly. So if you've done a diligent duty and have very nice working ABD mass functions and very nice working lamb property functions and very nice working high, high growth thermal functions, all that sort of stuff, you'll you'll have backups. You'll have the answers. You'll know what the answers are with you know ten strokes of a key, right? So if you've been just keeping up on the homework, you're gonna take this thing to Pound Town, all right? So. <laughs> So the reason to keep up on the homework. Other questions? OK, so if there's no further questions, let's dive in on the review document. Uh, where did I put that? Is that here? Nope. Study guide. Here we go. OK, so the study guide also available on Blackboard under the sort of exams tab. And I've broken the study guide into four areas. You'll notice that it is not nearly as long as the study guides that I laid out for 429 generally. And it's more because in the beginning of 429, we did a lot of stuff with matrix materials. What is a composite? What I would call generally like memorization things where it's like, uh, which fiber is more brittle? What is the thermoplastic matrix? You know, kind of tell me some manufacturing processes, more of like memorization stuff, right? That would require you to kind of like memorize information for the test or know this information. For this study guide, what we've been doing the last five weeks is pretty intense math, really. And what I think is important for you coming out of all of this is to understand the relationships between all of the bits that make up all of the math. OK, so what is strain physically? What are curvatures physically? How do we relate line loads to strains? And how do we even develop these line loads anyways? What's the difference between a force that we apply and a line load that we apply? And why would we develop line loads instead of forces and all, just all these sort of kind of tangential pieces of information that go into the equations that you use. All right. Any robot can sort of look at an equation and, and calculate if given the right information. Right. But it requires a human being with intelligence to decipher what the variables are physically and relate them physically to kind of what's going on. And that's sort of what I'm hoping to sort of hammer home with this 
study guide here is that you need to know physically what these things are, how they're related, and how we can develop each one of these things given other pieces of information. Okay, so this is the study guide. You can take a look at it uh, on your own. And what I've done for this particular lecture today is I've transferred these individual pieces to the writing pad, and I'm actually going to sort of write on this text with the writing pad. So you'll see what I mean in just a second here. You guys like my meme today? On the road to success, there are no shortcuts. As this truck tries to take a shortcut under this very short bridge. That's kind of funny. The iron E is strong with that one. So here we are. How is the, the readability of this? Is it too small? Can I get some like comments in the chat? Is it is it legible? I just don't know if that text is too big or too small. Text is okay? All right, good. Well, let's let's uh, get on with it then. All right, so first bullet here. I've kind of broken this down into what you need for hand calculation and what you need for theory. All right, so for hand calculations, some things that I think you should be ready to do is transform stresses and strains between principal and arbitrary coordinates using transformation matrices. All right, well, this is something that goes back even to uh, ME429, all right, where if you need to use strain transformation matrices, you should be comfortable doing this by now, okay? So for transforming strains, you're going to have things like strain in the one, two coordinate system equal to the T star matrix, right? The special matrix for strain transformations times something like epsilon in the XY coordinate system. All right. So arbitrary strains in some random coordinate system get transformed to the principal material coordinates using the T star matrix and vice versa. And for stresses, we have a very similar setup. One, two equal to the T matrix multiplied by the stresses in XY. Okay. You should be comfortable with those sorts of things at this point. Uh, I don't know what else to tell you. you should, should, we've been, this goes back to ME429. All right, so that's that general idea. It's being able to transform things uh, from random coordinate systems to principal material coordinates. All right, next, calculate entries of the ABD matrices by hand. I'm not going to ask you to calculate the whole A matrix. That would be absolutely ridiculous or the whole B matrix or the whole C matrix, okay? If it comes to the test, I might ask you something like, here's a laminate stacking sequence, here are the associated lamina stiffnesses, what is the A22 entry, for instance, okay? So remember what our general equations are for these guys, it's something like AIJ equals the summation from K equals one to N of Q bar IJ for angle theta, multiplied by ZK minus ZK minus one. All right, so that's your A. B is similar. And don't forget your one half. Oh my goodness, don't forget your one half. I guarantee on the test, someone is gonna forget their one half. Guarantee it, guaranteed. All right, Q bar IJ for angle theta. And here is ZK squared minus ZK minus one squared and DIJ. Don't forget your one third. Rawr. K equals one to N of Q bar IJ theta ZK minus one cubed minus. Oh, sorry, that's backwards. ZK cubed minus ZK minus one cubed. All right, so those are your equations here. You got to know what each one of these things are, all right? What is cube bar ij theta? If you don't know, you're going to be in trouble, all right? What are these z components, all right? If you don't know physically what that is for a laminate, you're going to have problems, all right? Like, you got to know what these things are. So there will be a question where you have to calculate this stuff. I'll just tell you, all right? So be ready to do it by hand, all right? You did it on homework number one, so review that if you need to. All right. Next, calculating loads and moments per unit length given ABD matrices and lamina midplane strains and curvatures. So this is just 
remembering what the definition of the laminate stiffness matrix is and how it relates strains to curvatures. Okay, so if you're uh, going to calculate loads and moments per unit length, so you're going to calculate what is N and M given the ABD matrices. So this is A, B, B, D multiplied by midplane strains and curvatures. All right, so this is like loads coming from curvatures and their general relationship. All right, so this relationship you should also know. Um, be ready for that one. All right, so those are calculations that I might expect you to do using those kind of general equations. I mean, this is sort of a tangential thing that just comes up in all sorts of problems. So you should just be ready to be doing those sorts of things anyway, all right? I won't ask you to do that transformation directly, but that might be a tangential part of another problem. All right, now theory questions. Understand the physical interpretations of the ABD matrices, okay? So let's talk about this guy, all right? So here, understand the physical interpretation of ABD matrices. So if we look at this equation here, remember what the relationship is like between midplane strains and loads. So we'll have something like the load is equal to a epsilon naught plus b kappa. All right. Similarly with the moments, if we sort of expand out that uh, equation down at the bottom there, it's b epsilon zero plus uh, d times kappa. All right. So physically, what is the actual interpretation of the A, B, and the D matrices? All right, well, the A matrix relates what loads I apply to what longitudinal strains that I develop. All right, so remember that this N term is the sort of the forces that we apply to our laminate. All right, and so A tells you in proportion to how much loading you apply, how much am I going to elongate, all right? So if A is very, very large, then a large force will give you a very small elongation, all right? If A is very, very small, then it only takes a small force to have very long elongation, all right? Think about this in terms of sort of like an elastic modulus. It's very similar to like an elastic modulus term, okay? Where the more stiffness you have, the less you will strain given a certain applied load, all right? So that's kind of what it means physically this um, this term here, A, all right? Now, what about this beta term or this B term? So this is a, a sort of a term that relates how much curvature I will get on my laminate given some applied load, all right? So if I apply some load, how much is my laminate going to bend or curve, all right? Which is a very strange thing and it's specific only for composite materials. So I load this guy up in sort of a typical longitudinal fashion and it curves into and out of the plane with sort of like these curvatures that we've sort of been talking about. So this B matrix is kind of a weird one and this guy here is specific you know for composites. Right? We have a very uh, similar relationship here between the applied moments and the resulting uh, longitudinal strains. So the B matrix also relates if I'm going to put a bending moment on this piece how much does it strain longitudinally? which is also kind of a strange idea. Usually when we think of applying a bending moment, we think of the laminate curving, all right? But this would tell us that we can apply some bending moment and our laminate will elongate a certain amount proportional to the stiffness matrix B, right? Uh, similar vein, the relationship between curvatures and the D matrix is that we apply a bending moment, the D matrix tells us how much the laminate curves. All right, if D is very, very small, it doesn't take a large moment for us to have a significant curvature. And if D is very, very large, then it takes a large moment for us to even bend our laminate just a little bit. All right, so that's kind of the general idea there. Those are what those things actually mean uh, physically. All right, no definitions of special laminates. All right, so I had a series of slides on this. I don't think I can fit all the information kind of in the space that I have here, but definition of special laminates would be things like uh, cross ply, which is all 90 and zero layers, 
there's symmetric. Um, so there's definition for that, so on and so forth. All right. So remember all of our special laminates. It was things like anti-symmetric, cross ply, angle ply, balanced, symmetric. Know what those terms actually mean in terms of the laminate stacking sequence. And beyond that, you should know how the A, B, and D matrices simplify for those special laminates. So for a cross ply, for instance, we have something like the A12, A16, D12, D16, all equal to zero. All right, so that's special for a cross ply lamp. And fortunately for you, I've put together in the equation sheet. So I'm going to bring up the equation sheet here just for a second. The equation sheet for this class contains that information. So here, symmetric plies. Uh, mirror about the midplane, anti-symmetric, plus theta for every minus theta about midplane, so on and so forth. So in the back end of the laminate, um, the first laminate lecture notes, we have descriptions about what all these things are and how the A, B, and D matrices simplify, and so here they are. Okay, so make sure that you're kind of up on those things. There's probably going to be some theory questions about that. All right, let us continue. Where are we? Here we are. All right, lastly, be ready to sketch deformations of a laminate given a six by one vector of in-plane strands and curvatures. Your homework three sketches, very suspicious. A lot of people kind of really not understanding this idea of strains and curvatures. So let's draw some. All right, I'll go on to sort of a new, um, new sheet here. So strains and curvatures. So generally the six by one strain and curvature vector looks something like this, where we have like epsilon x zero, epsilon y zero, gamma x y zero, kappa x, kappa y, and kappa x y. All right. Now I want to sort of draw what each one of these things is because it seems that people are having struggles understanding what it means to have strain in the X, strain in the Y, uh, curvature in the X, curvature in the Y, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's actually take some time to draw what these guys actually are. So for strain in the X and strain in the Y, hopefully these are pretty straightforward to you guys. So if you have a, a laminate that is undeformed, and we're looking at it from the top, so we're kind of in like this XY coordinate system. So this is undeformed. And let's assume now that we have some positive epsilon X and positive epsilon Y. Well, that just means that this thing is going to elongate in X and elongate in Y. All right. So if we have positive strains in the X and positive strains in the Y, then this guy will be deformed. with positive epsilon x zero, that is sort of this displacement, and positive epsilon y zero, which is sort of this displacement or expansion. So if you see only positive epsilon x and only positive epsilon y, this thing is just dilatating, right? It's just expanding in the x and y directions, all right? So that's drawing uh, these strains in the x and strains in the y. Now. The shear strain, this is a little bit different. So let's take a look at this. This will again be in like the XY coordinate system. And we'll start with our general undeformed laminate. Okay. And let's uh, say that we have a positive gamma XY. So the way that I like to think about drawing shear strain is uh, something like gamma xy, if it's positive, that means it's on the positive x face in the positive y direction, or on the negative x face in the negative y direction. So if we have some positive shear strain, then the way this thing is going to deform is it's generally going to have its same character uh, at these sort of internodes here, 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 and here, but it's going to deform in sort of this like elongated way 
or positive x on the positive y direction. So it's going to kind of elongate this way, positive x face, positive y direction. Here's the positive y face, positive x direction, the negative x, sorry, the negative y face, negative x direction, uh, negative x face, negative y direction. So that's generally how it's going to kind of like shear out if we have a positive value. So it should end up looking something like, I'm going to exaggerate this sort of as much as I can. Something like that. All right, so this is uh, undeformed. And this is deformed with positive gamma x, y. All right, if you had negative, then you would have positive x face, negative direction, negative x face, positive direction, positive y face, negative direction, negative x face, positive y direction. You'd have deformation that looked like that, and you'd have a curvature or sort of a strain in this laminate that would sort of be the other kind of pinching direction. I don't want to draw it over that because it's getting a little busy right now, but hopefully you sort of get the idea. All right, so that's what that particular strain component looks like on the laminate if you're looking at it from above. All right, next thing we'll talk about these curvatures because this also seems to kind of throw people off. So let's look at uh, what would be kind of like a kappa x. So for this, we need to sort of think about looking at the laminate from the side. All right. So in this particular situation, we're going to look at the y z plane because kappa x will occur about what would be the x axis. All right. So curvature in x will sort of cause the laminate to sort of curve around the x-axis. So if we have an original laminate that maybe looked something like this from the side, then if we have curvature in the x-direction, our curvature will point if it's positive in the positive z-direction. So our deformed geometry would look something like this. All right, so this is curvature of a laminate with positive kappa, okay? So we see that it's kind of tending to curve about the x-axis, and in this situation, the magnitude of that curvature is one divided by the radius of curvature. So if this has some circular arc that it's sort of cutting out, then the radius of curvature, uh, this is one on kappa x, all right? So that's the general idea. So this is curvature about x. You have a very similar thing for curvature about y, except now we're not looking at the yz plane, we're looking at the xz plane. All right, so if this is my undeformed configuration, and I say that I'm gonna apply some positive curvature about y, okay, well, again, I'm gonna apply some positive curvature so that I point in the positive z direction And my radius of curvature of this guy is one on kappa y. All right. Lastly, this guy. He's probably the most complicated. All right. But let's see what we can do. So this kind of requires a three-dimensional drawing. Uh, it's just a little bit heady. So let's try. And I'm telling you right now, I'm not an artist. I'll do my best. But here, let's say we have x, y, z, and our undeformed configuration looks something like this. All right. Now, what's going to happen with this kappa x, y curvature is that we're going to have sort of curved splines along the, the lengths of the laminate. So what that means is you're going to end up with the sides that are kind of raised and lowered on opposite corners. So what do I mean by that? All right. Well... Uh, with a positive kappa xy, we'd have something like there and there, and we're steady at the nodes. So just give me a second to sort of set this up. The idea here is this guy comes something like that. This guy, something like that. This guy, something like that. And this guy, something like that. All right, so that's sort of your deformed laminate with this 
kappa xy term. All right, it's got like opposite corners pulled down and near corners sort of pulled up. All right, it's kind of the best I can do. Hopefully we sort of uh, can envision that. So this is a positive kappa xy. And that's sort of what that looks like. Probably shouldn't expect me to ask you to sketch that on the test. Just saying. That one's kind of hard. All right. And if I try to like look at some of your three dimensional drawings, oof, I don't know, suspicious. All right. So those are the curvatures and strains from what would be this sort of six by one strain and curvature vector. Any questions about that? Because that's some very suspicious drawings with your homework number three. And that is definitely something I wanted to, to hammer out. All right, doesn't look like any questions. So that's good, let's continue then. Laminate engineering properties. Hand calculations, be ready to calculate mean stress on a laminate given applied loads or vice versa. All right, so just a reminder of what this is, is when we apply loads to a laminate, uh, we convert them to line loads and then to mean stresses. So let's talk about uh, exactly how we do that. So for hand calculations, you want to calculate mean stress on a limit again applied loads or vice versa. All right, so in this situation, if we want to calculate the mean stresses, that's something like sigma bar x, sigma bar y, and tau bar xy. Well, that's equal to the line loads that we apply, nx, ny, and ns, the shear loads, multiplied by one on the thickness of the laminate h. All right, and vice versa. Obviously, if you want to go back, then kind of bring the H to the other side. That's all there is to it. So remember that these are mean stresses. They're so mean. And this is your applied line loads. And remember for applied line loads that we had something like nx equals the force on x divided by the length of the laminate in y. Ny similarly fy on lx, so on and so forth. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, if you have a laminate that looks like this with coordinate system x, y, z, and we apply some loads on there that's like and x and and y. Uh, sorry, it should be f's. Apply loads on there that are something like fx and fy. Then nx, which is here, would be the normalization of like something like fx by the length of the laminate over which that x. So here is Ly. So if we're talking about the line load that's applied, it's just the force on that face normalized by the width of that sample. All right, similarly, if this is Lx, you have Fy and Lx, and for Ns, you could normalize by either direction. All right, so that's the idea there. Seems like some people had some issues with that uh, as well. All right, next. Calculate laminate engineering properties given the A matrix or vice versa. So this comes back to uh, sort of the notes and understanding the definition of what the A matrix is relative to these uh, laminate engineering compliance matrices. So I'll pull this up really quick instead of writing it on the paper. So remember we had this general formulation here. And so if I wanted to look at bringing that over to, I think I can do this, let's see. Yes, it worked. OK, 
Okay, so here, calculate limit engineering properties given the A matrix or vice versa. Well, the A matrix here is going to be this guy in limited engineering properties. Multiplied by this guy. All right, because remember that the general relationship is for a symmetric matrix. This general function, OK? So this and this together are the A matrix. Their powers combined, they are Captain Planet. No, just kidding. They're the A matrix. So that's relating the A matrix to those limited engineering properties. And we talked about this a lot, right? So in the lecture notes, we had this series of uh, discussions about doing a uh, experiment with only tension in the x direction and then out pop some entries of the a matrix so on and so forth okay so we define then like the elastic modulus in the x direction as one divided by h times a11 so from that we can relate the laminate engineering property epsilon x to the compliance matrix a11 entry in such a fashion all right where it's one on h times epsilon x which is kind of exactly what you see here uh, with this particular matrix here is one on epsilon x times one on h all right it's the general idea so that's relating the a matrix to laminated engineering properties all right next calculate midplane strains on a laminate given applied loads on a laminate and an engineering constant of the laminate all right so that's essentially just this concept over again all right so it's just using, utilizing that general equation, all right? So if I gave you the engineering constants measured from some experiment, you could calculate the A matrix and figure out what the resulting strains are, all right? That would be an example question. All right, for theory questions. Understand the difference between laminate stiffness values and lamina stiffness values. Ooh, complicated. All right, so here, understand the difference between laminate stiffness values and lamina stiffness values, all right? Hopefully you sort of get this concept where um, for a lamina, which is a single layer, that's something like this, where we have fibers all running in one direction. All right, so our coordinate system here is one direction along fibers, two direction across fibers. All right, so the elastic modulus in the one direction, usually much, much greater than elastic modulus in the two direction, and understand what those moduli are for the lamina, the single layer. All right, now that's different from the laminate modulus, where for a laminate, now usually we look something like this, where we have some multiple layers inside of this laminate. All right, so maybe let's like make this three layers thick. Okay, so laminate will typically have like a global X, Y, Z coordinate system. And the resulting moduli in like, let's say the X direction is this sort of mean modulus epsilon X if we're sort of loading here. And across would be something like epsilon bar y. And across here would be something like epsilon bar y. All right. So these are your mean elastic modulus of the laminate. It's the resistance to straining given some applied stress. All right. So kind of understand that general topic. Now, how do we relate lamina stiffnesses to laminate stiffnesses? OK. Well, if these are all, let's say they're all zero degree layers, then you would have a situation where E1, which is a lamina stiffness, would be the same as E bar X, okay? Because if we have all zero layers, then the modulus of this laminate would be the same as the modulus of a single lamina, all right? 
So that's that idea. Maybe if one of those layers was a 90 degree layer, then your laminate modulus would be reduced compared to the E1 value, right? So then your E bar X would be less than the stiffness of a single lamina, right? But it would probably be greater than the modulus of the lamina in the two direction. Okay, so sort of understanding what happens if we build a laminate with these individual lamina, what expected stiffnesses might we have with these individual pieces? All right, so that's that kind of concept there. All right, so understand differences between applied forces, forces per unit legs, and mean stresses. Okay, so we just kind of talked about that over here. All right, understand the difference between stress in a single layer and the mean stress acting on the laminate. All right, so this goes back to our picture that talks about or shows or illustrates the difference in stresses between the individual layers of a laminate. So I'm going to pull that picture in here because I think it'll be helpful for our discussion. Okay, so this is a picture you should have in your mind when you're thinking about a multi-stack laminate. What is the strain in that laminate? What is the modulus in that laminate? What is the stress in that laminate? So we talked about this picture uh, quite a bit as well, where we're talking about, yes, if you have a continuous strain throughout the laminate, which is kind of a prerequisite for all the theory that we've done so far, all right? The strain is continuous in the laminate. And we know that each of the sort of moduli of each one of these particular layers is different in each one of the directions. So then we would say that the stress in each one of the individual layers, this is like the stress in the XY coordinate system for layer number one. This is the stress in the XY coordinate system for layer number two, stress in the XY coordinate system for layer number three, and stress in the XY coordinate system for layer number four. All right, so these are like the stresses in the individual lamina. So here are the stress distributions in each one of those layers. And then we have a mean stress here, which is like the average of all of those stresses over the whole laminate, right? So that's the difference between stress in an individual layer and the mean stress, where sort of the mean stress is defined using the mean value theorem, where here sigma bar X is something like one on H integrated from the thickness. So uh, what would be? h on 2 to h on 2 of all the stress in the x direction dx. All right, so it's sort of the average of all of the stress components that are acting in x. All right, so that's your mean stress definition. All right, how are we doing? Got about five minutes left. So I haven't quite made it through all of the stuff. You want me to just keep going or do people have specific questions? Any questions? Now's your time to ask questions before I just continue in through the high growth thermal. All right, I'm gonna push forward then. For high growth thermal stresses, be ready to calculate coefficients of thermal expansion and moisture expansion for a single lamina. All right, so those are in the notes. They are here. So this is calculating coefficient of thermal expansion and coefficients of moisture expansion for a single lamina given constituent properties. So you did this on the high growth thermal homework, problem number one. Calculate forces and moments which result on a laminate given changes in temperature and moisture. All right, so we had that relationship in those notes as well. And you did that for problem number two on the high growth thermal uh, set of notes. All right, so bring those up. So 
So for us, that is here. It's a combination of sort of the stresses that evolve in each one of the individual layers. That's for the loads. And you have a similar looking equation for uh, the moments, which is here. All right. Or if you want to formally calculate them, they're sort of here. All right. It resembles very much the, in this situation, the calculation of the B matrix uh, for lamina, laminate stiffnesses because we have this like ZK squared minus ZK minus one squared term. For theory, understand the strain response of a single unconstrained lamina undergoing temperature change or moisture change. So here, let's talk about this quick. Remember, if we have a single lamina, all right, or in this direction, we have things like alpha 1 and beta 1. And in this direction, we have things like alpha 2 and beta 2. So if we heat this thing uniformly or it absorbs moisture uniformly because there is no sort of dilatational expansion that happens here then if we heat this uniformly it's just going to expand uniformly so if we heat this or it absorbs moisture it's only going to expand sort of in these general directions it's not going to let's say shear like this all right it's not going to do any of that shearing stuff all right so that's something you got to understand it's fully dilatational expansion and contraction all right next be prepared to describe how residual strains and curvatures develop in a laminate after manufacturing so that's kind of from the first three or four slides of the hydrothermal stress notes all right so you need to know why these residual stresses develop uh, if we want to think about an example, remember I gave the very simplistic example where if you have like a 0, 090 laminate and you cooled this thing down, then the 90 degree layer is going to want to shrink much more than the 0 degree layer. And so you'll end up with some curved laminate. that looks like this because the 90 degree layer has shrunken way more than the zero degree layer has. So you end up with this curvature on this laminate and this is the basis for how the curvatures developed in the composite that we manufactured. It was like a zero 090 laminate. All right, last thing, laminate failure theory, no hand calculations required. That's because the calculations for laminate failure is crazy. All right, those of you who have completed homework number four, know that those calculations are intense. So I would only ask theory questions on this guy. Uh, just be prepared for theory questions. Things like understand the failure progression for these laminated composites. Do they all fail at the same time? OK, the answer is no. Layers fail at different times. Which layers are most vulnerable? Usually it's like the 90 degree layers which are most vulnerable, so you should know that piece of information. OK, so understand progressively how they fail. And then understand the difference between first ply failure and laminate ultimate failure. So if we think about what our failure progression might look like, if we looked at strain and stress on a laminate, it might load up with something that looks like this. So understand what this figure is going on, where here this is first ply failure. And this sort of point would constitute ultimate failure. So first ply failure, we would say that the laminate has failed after the first ply has failed. And ultimate failure is we would say the laminate has failed after the last ply has failed. OK, know which one is more conservative or less conservative. Obviously, this one is much more conservative. That's because you're saying that the laminate has failed even when the first layer has failed, which I think is generally a better process. You don't want to have composites working out there that have failed layers and you're like, yeah, that's cool. No big deal. We just got one failed layer. It's no big deal. We'll just keep going. All right. You don't. Want that. OK, so that's it. Hopefully uh, you guys feel prepared. Uh, again, the exam's not meant to be like 
RAR incredibly difficult. I think you should be able to get it done relatively quickly. Most of you are probably going to be done in 30 minutes. Um, you can use MATLAB. You can use whatever you want. Everything available to you. Uh, just please make sure you have your camera on, pointed at you, showing me your work as you go. All right. So thanks for coming. That's it for today. I'll stick around. People have questions. Ta-ta. Get homework four done.